together. It's uh, my privilege and honor uh, this morning to do a lightning round with Karen Simon Becker, who is the co-founder, uh, with Ken is back here someplace, yeah, co-founder of what we know is Clear back in 2010. And uh, Karen is known as an innovator, an entrepreneur, an investor, a motivator, and a leader. And so she's taken this company with Ken to make it into something that is, I don't want to say ubiquitous, but in over almost 50 Working airports now. Yeah. And yeah. In, oh, 15 or so professional sports arenas uh, yep. around the country. And so what, just a few questions about identity management, verification, how does that work? How does that help improve security as opposed to having long queues, which could be a terrorist target, as we all know. So Karen, if we could just start off, uh, lots of other things to say about her, but uh, we may have time for one or two questions, depending on how long we go. So tell us about, uh, in terms of clear, what is your goal, your motivation, and how do you go about accomplishing that? Yeah, and so let me also start by saying thank you to you. In 2012, when you launched PreCheck, um, you really brought risk-based screening and identity-based screening to checkpoints, and I think permanently transformed um, the trajectory of airport security. So I want to say a big thank you thank to you. you. The beginning motivation before we ever get to biometrics was to make uh, experiences safer and easier. 9-11 had an impact on me and my life. And the ability to be part of the solution uh, on behalf of American travelers uh, was really the motivation. I started on Wall Street, and as I said, I didn't want to die and have people say I picked good stocks. I wanted to build something that made the world a better place. My parents both worked for the government. I grew up here in Maryland. That was the beginning motivation. And uh, we're working on it every day. We now have over 3,200 team members who are making it happen. Yeah. And it's rooted in biometrics, right? And so biometrics are about building an impermeable link between you and your unique characteristics, face, fingerprint, eyes, voice, and there's more coming. People talk about gate and also G-A-I-T gate uh, and all sorts of, of other things. And you know, without the ability, the technology was undeveloped 50 years ago to use biometrics, we took to using plastic cards to assert identity, who we are and what we should have access to. And in a post 9-11 environment, there were these trade-offs between making experiences safer or easier, right? That which made it safer created longer lines or more difficult experiences, and that which made it easier or what we call frictionless at clear made it less safe. And we saw biometrics as the and, making it safer and easier. It was used uh, in the military in 2010 when we started CLEAR. It was used in Brazil for voting 13 years ago. Some thoughts here mm -hmm. for the US. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was used in Asia for financial services. And so we really believed in the consumerization of biometrics in the US mm -hmm. and have gone about building an interoperable biometric identity platform where you can enroll once assert and then assert your identity in multiple use cases. And today we have well over 14 million uh, Americans on the platform and using it. And so the motivation is every day when people say they love Clear, they trust Clear, and it changes their lives. Yeah, uh, thank you for that overview. So you mentioned biometrics, that's what drives the company, the policies, the procedures, the protocols. How are biometrics more secure than what we all know? The longer password you can do, all that? There's ways of doing it, but so just tell us briefly about that. Right. It's sort of interesting. I use one password, and I look, and I have 146 passwords in there, which, by the way, I unlock with my face, right? So yeah. it's interesting. But you're using these pins to assert your identity, who you are and what you should have access to, whether it be logging on to Okta or your New York Times account. And so... You know, is that the safest way? And we believe identity is connecting you to all the things that make you you. ID is one piece of that, but not only the cards in your wallet, but also your attributes and insights. And I think in a post-COVID environment where the world has gone more digital, um, far faster than I think anyone expected, security, trust, and identity are foundational. You read articles of late about LinkedIn, and it's an epidemic. People are impersonating um, you know, many people. And so there's a whole article about CISOs and people are real picture, totally fake job. And then there's people writing, oh, you know, that's one of the top 50 CISOs because someone said they were the CISO at Coca-Cola. Mm -hmm. 
And so it's really about building um, this interoperable system, connecting you to all your attributes and insights. I'm always me, but I'm one person when I show up at the hospital. I'm Karen, I'm my healthcare insurance, I'm my eligibility, I'm my copay, and my electronic health records. I'm still Karen when I show up at the airport, and I'm my driver's license, my boarding pass, my frequent flyer number, my pre-check status, whatever the case may be. And so the ability to connect you is actually safer and easier from a security perspective. Uh, because we started as a public-private partnership with the Department of Homeland Security 13 years ago, we're FISMA high, a multi-layered system in GovCloud. Um, and so it's about building this very secure system. But I also believe that people are oversharing today. So when you hand someone a plastic card, a driver's license, there's a lot of PII on that. They just need to see that you're over 21. Right, if you're doing something that you need to be over Just 21 on. Oh. And so all they need to know is you're Karen Seidman Becker and I'm over 21. And so I really believe that biometrics are safer and um, more frictionless than the 13 user passcode. Uh, Ken happens to have a, a Coinbase account and he's constantly telling me that he gets locked out because he can't remember the 12 unit password. So he's you know, having to retake a picture of his driver's license and reassert his identity. Right? That's not optimal on multiple use cases. You have a drop off of conversion, you have less security, and so I clearly believe biometrics are the future and I think the future is here. So you talk about that, the, the ability to use biometrics, that those individual unique identifiers for, for each person. <clears throat> what does CLEAR do in terms of preserving and securing that database from all these hacks out there, all these? Yeah, examples? absolutely. You know, because we started in aviation, and because we started in a public-private partnership, um, security has been job one from day one. Mm -hmm. And both how we've constructed the system and architected the system from a multi-layer perspective, um, and then the, the different right, requirements that have gone on from FISMA High, which wasn't there right, mm -hmm. a decade ago, and we met uh, the data being in GovCloud, but also, um, you want to serve partners where they want to be served. That could be on the cloud, that could be on the phone, longer term, that could be on the chain. Mm -hmm. Also, when you think about it, multi-factor authentication, right? So sometimes maybe face is good enough, but sometimes it's face and voice, sometimes it's fingerprints and iris. And so different use cases require different biometrics or, or different permutations, right? So if you are your, your face is your ticket to get into the Yankees game or to buy a beer, it's very different than getting on an airplane. Mm -hmm. And so um, constructing a system, and again, I th also think from a culture perspective, because we started with just uh, me and Ken in, in a room in 2010, uh, and now have 3,200 team members across the country, it's really about um, your culture and your leadership and, and how you construct it and how you partner. So I, I'm just curious, uh, if you, you are a member of CLEAR or you know somebody who is, just show of hands. Okay. So there's, yeah, so probably get some testimonials, hopefully positive. We won't do that right now. Not enough, but look, that's opportunity. Yeah, that's opportunity. <laughs> um, so one of the keys is, uh, one of the keys uh, in terms of clear providing the expedited queue uh, at the TSA um, checkpoint, it's not the security, the physical security, it's the information security that helps inform TSA as to whether known and trusted travel, but this person who shows up is a person who's purporting to be that person on the boarding pass and all that. So it is that public-private partnership. What, what do you say to those people who say, well, that's, that's fine, but it's still not the physical security that TSA has to do? What's right. the partnership there? Look, I think uh, TSA owns the physical screening 100%, but you have to actually pull back for a minute. When somebody's journey begins, it begins when they book a ticket. It begins the day of travel when they leave their house. And so building multiple use cases along that chain, it's not just the airport security checkpoint. And so you want to build a system that when I go back to interoperable, interoperable with TSA, that we can tell TSA, this is Karen Seidman Becker, what they want to do with it. But we already have 14 and a half million people on the platform who have already enrolled, you want to be able to say, this is Karen Seidenbecker, assuming Karen Seidenbecker, of course, opts in for that. And then you want to go back, though, because there's bag drop, right, which creates lines. There's lounge access. There's boarding. There's concessions. We have something on a, on a mobile app called Home to Gate. It tells you when to leave your house to get to your gate, 40 minutes to go, because we've mapped out the travel, the airport security lane, and then we've mapped the walk from the security lane to your gate, right? It's about putting it all together. And TSA is responsible 
right, for physical screening. And I think our public-private partnership, and we have uh, innovation partnerships going with them about how you work together to drive innovation further, faster. But uh, we fully respect what the Department of Homeland Security sure. has to do, and I think it's with that respect and that innovation that you work together. So, but I, I acknowledge the challenge of public-private partnerships. Yeah, yeah. So last question I have, and then I think we'll have time to, to take one or two questions. So the future biometrics writ large, and uh, what does the checkpoint of the future look like from your perspective? Uh, you know, I think you mm -hmm. see the checkpoint of the future in places outside the U.S., mm -hmm. right? A lot of automation um, and a lot of uh, technology. So um, I was in Dubai, uh, you know, in December, and there's e-gates. In Asia, there's e-gates. Uh, there's facial to get into. In Kenya, you, you know, use biometrics there. And so I think that biometrics from curb to gate, bag drop to boarding, never having to take your wallet out of your pocket mm. is absolutely the future. And I think on behalf of American travelers who have had really challenged experiences over the past year, I mean, we talked about this. If you're two and a half million today, how are you going to scale that experience to three million, to four million? I also think there's opportunities for remote network monitoring, right? So I think you can make it safer and easier. I think it can benefit airlines because more people will travel. They'll get on planes happier. I think that net promoter score, customer happiness, is something we're obsessed with as well as security. And when people are happy, they will travel more. Mm -hmm. And those are good things. And so I really, I also think, uh, you know, how do you have screening off-site? And that there, there's all sorts of things: sterile buses, landslide. There's so many opportunities. And I do believe that it's not just the biometrics piece, right, but the, the hardware piece and making sure it's interoperable. Right. And, um, and so I think it's a really excite, challenge time in travel, but that from crisis comes opportunity. And I think uh, you know, the travel industry has had 9-11, then it had the downturn of 2008, 2009, then it had the pandemic, and it's like every 10 years there's another challenge. And we have to invest for the future and we have to invest together in an airport. There's the airport employees, the airline employees, the TSA employees, sometimes the police or the fire department, depending upon. And you really need people working together on behalf of American travelers to, to make it safer and easier. And so we're excited to play, you know, to play a role in that. Oh, good. You open to taking a couple questions? Sure. So, questions. Uh, John, right here. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, Jane. <laughs> so, Karen, two things, real quick. Uh, how do you address, well, last night we hosted a debate on misinformation. How do you address the misinformation around biometric biases and issues in that? And number two, you're collecting a lot of PII data. How secure is it? What are you doing with it, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so, first of all, something that I have been very transparent on from the beginning, because we started with fingerprints and eyes, is that there is racial bias and facial recognition. And um, that is something that the industry is working on, and I think massive improvements have been made. But to not say that, I think, is dishonest. And, and I think, um, you know, we've built a lot of technology to help that, and it's something we continue to work on. But you know, through lights, and you see the new Google camera that they talk about on their phone, the industry is addressing it. But I think you have to be transparent about it, number one. Uh, number two, there's two points. There's privacy and there's data security. Right? And so from a privacy perspective, uh, we've always said we do not sell, share, or rent data. Right? We have said that everything we do is opt-in. And that's really important, both in the US, as you see the US privacy laws in California and BIPA and Illinois, but also internationally with GDPR, et cetera. And so we've always built a system that is compliant from a privacy perspective. And again, when we talk about data security and a multi-layered approach and starting in aviation, I always say we didn't start with buying bottled water at the corner deli, right? And saying, oh yeah, you know, it's good enough. We started here in aviation security. Um, where uh, there was a regulatory environment, right? We started in a public-private partnership with the Department of Homeland Security, and our system has been constructed accordingly. So, the, yep, Jane. Karen, congratulations on your success. It's a huge, great company, and uh, everyone here is uh, impressed. Certainly, I'm impressed. But it's, I wanted to ask uh, a related question to what uh, whatever his name is just asked you. <laughs> I forget his I name. that one down. Uh, uh, and that Sorry, is, you, you've made it clear that people opt in. And if they don't want to be part of it, they don't have to be part of it. But as you build an international network, 
Uh, aren't you kind of stuck with lower standards, possibly in other countries? And uh, what about travelers who go to China? Let's just pick a random country, China. <laughs> and how, how, <laughs> how secure is, is your uh, impressive database when they land in China? And uh, We're not with there. whatever That's they have on their uh, devices. Um, yeah, so I think that's a really important piece, which is uh, today we are not in China, Russia, or places like that. And we made a, I think I started with as a mother of three, I had no desire to fly there. So that was sort of off the table. And then it became a data security issue. Uh, and, and so the answer is that um, you know if something's in the cloud, it's it's in our cloud here in the U.S. on GovCloud where CIA data is, and there's no access over there. We're not even over there. Uh, and so also as a FISMA high company, um, not only do all the components have to be right within regulatory spec and nothing from China, but the employees who touch the equipment have to be. And the data on the phone is on the phone and encrypted, and from a face perspective, is just simply that. And so, um, whether by by luck or by skill, we're not over there, and uh, everything we do is encrypted at rest and encrypted at transit. And yeah. So I think you'll be around for at least a little bit after yeah. the session and after the next session for, uh, uh, during the break or something. So let's give a, a warm thanks to Karen Simon Becker.